All right, well, the Bills' former All-Pro center, Eric Wood, of course, radio, author, dad, traveler, wing eater, trying to think of all the other things you've been doing recently. But uh, welcome back, bro. Good to see you, man. Always a pleasure, brother. Hey, man, tell me about it because, you know, I I hear you on the radio all the time and you were talking about uh, this past weekend and how crazy it was with the weather. And you like I could not. But the one thing that stood out from the interview I heard you do, I think it was the guys in GR and and you talked about having wings and, you know, you came up for the weekend with a buddy and like his son or something. And then you told them that you drove home after the game, like straight shot through. And I'm like, my God. How did you possibly do that and 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 uh, and and not just be looking at the back of your eyelids, man? Yeah, I will say this. Um, and you know as much as I do from doing media, being on and being locked in for that amount of time, you know, you leave the game and you're still wired, but then eventually you're gonna come down from it. And so a little bit of caffeine and uh, having some companions for the ride was great, but you know, ultimately with me spending an extra day up there, I was ready to get home. The week's already going to be condensed. The following day, I got one bills live. I got to record the Sean McDermott show. Um, I got WGR. So the earlier I can get back, the better. And as I was thinking about it after the game, going back to the hotel, falling asleep, and then driving back the next morning, uh, I just figured I'd, I'd push through and we made pretty good time coming home and you don't hit any of the traffic in the big cities when you leave that late too. So we made it through the Sunday night game, uh, provided some entertainment with the Bucks Eagles, uh, for a while. And then it's a couple podcasts in your home. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's a whole other thing. I mean, in terms of what's happened so far in the playoffs, we could spend a whole separate podcast just on you know, the fact that Houston beat Cleveland the way they did and Green Bay beat Dallas the way they did and then Tampa beat Philly the way they did and these supposed power teams just crumbling here at the end of the year, which sort of makes me a little bit afraid of of this weekend because I don't think, you know, look, if anybody's been a power team going down the stretch, it's been who? The Bills with six straight wins, right? So uh, what's happened so far makes me a little bit nervous, but what I've seen from them helps me with that. Um, for sure. One other thing, by the way, that you talked about in your radio thing was your uh, your cold bath or your air quotes, your actual pool. Right. Because right. it was so cold at home. You just get in there. Uh, listen, next week or this weekend, just just come into my front. I got six feet of snow on my front yard, man. If you just want to just lie out in the my front yard in my snow, I'm sure it'll do the same thing for you. Yeah, when you've had as many surgeries and bumps and bruises as I've had over the years, that that cold plunge generally makes your body feel pretty good. There's also some other health benefits to it, but uh, yeah, a little easier getting in the pool than maybe jumping in the snow. But yeah, I, I knew I wasn't getting much sympathy for the uh, Buffalo and Western New York residents as I was showing the uh, quarter inch of snow we had on our back patio and I got in the pool. But uh, <laughs> no, I mean... What what that what Western New York went through last weekend and everybody to get that game ready. I mean, there's so many people. I wish I knew people's names to even address them by name. The people that stayed up throughout the night, even getting the roads cleared, so then people could get to the stadium to then assist in shoveling the aisles. And you know, I was talking to Roger Goodell before the game. He was he was in attendance, Western New York native, and so he's in attendance. And he was saying there was a very real possibility of moving that football game. And, and look, I mean, you get three feet the night before the game, it it seems unlikely. And, you know, they were able to get all the aisles clear, uh, which was great. They didn't get the rows clear per se all over the place, but they had to get the aisles or else people can't get safely up and down. It just becomes a monster liability letting people into the stadium. So for the people that worked around the clock to allow that game to happen, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah, for sure. No doubt about it. And it looked great watching it on television. looked awesome. People were just packed in there. It looked like there are no spaces missing um, at all. So let, let's talk a little bit about the game. I mean, how, regardless of how it ends for the Bills, how is Josh Allen not the MVP of this league after what we saw the other day? I mean, j- just the run all by itself. And, and he's record after record after record after record after record, like all time, not just Bills, not just this season all-time records, he just keeps stacking them. How is this guy not the MVP? 
because the narrative on him since week one was he's a turnover machine. And yeah, he had four turnovers against the Jets on the most watched Monday night football game in history, which with the Bills facing off against Aaron Rodgers and the super team they built in New York this offseason or thought they built. And, and so they lose that game. Josh has four turnovers. Then all of a sudden, that's the narrative throughout the season. And no one wants to pay attention to the fact that Josh, similar to my guy Ryan Fitzpatrick, is not afraid to throw the ball up at the end of the half and get an interception. He's not afraid on third and 18 to have an arm punt down the field. So no one considers any of those things. They simply just focus on the fact that, oh, he had another turnover. He had another turnover. And I was watching something today, and they were talking about his 18 interceptions and 29 passing touchdowns. Okay, I'm I'm talking total touchdowns to turnover ratio. I'm I'm not talking just passing because you wouldn't necessarily do that for other quarterbacks, but we do it with Josh. And I feel like I feel like there's a lot of people that still want to be right about their pre-draft analysis of Josh Allen that kind of flirt that narrative, but give you know Lamar Jackson, who likely went a credit that they had the best record in the AFC this year. They got the one seed. He played consistent this year. He seems to have taken his passing game to the next level. But if you're looking at stats, I mean, Josh leads the league in total touchdowns. He leads the league in total yards. Those guys generally at the quarterback position win the MVP, especially when you're going into playoffs as the two seed on a five game win streak. Yeah, for sure. Um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about the Steeler game. You know, two other notes, I think, uh, that a lot of people have been talking about um, were guys that aren't, you know, the most recognized slash acclaimed to this point, but have been coached up to get to where they need to be in the most biggest situations. And let's start with first with Khalil Shakir. What do you think about his performance and how he's progressed this year? Yeah, I think he's been consistent all season and he's, He's a dream as a fifth round draft pick. You know, you take a guy in the fifth round and you hope he can play a role within your offense and he's carved out that role and he's great in the slot and he's made a number of plays this season. There was about a four game stretch where Josh was 100% throwing him the football. That shows me a couple things. One, he's sure handed and two, Josh trusts him to be where he needs to be because, you know, a lot, oftentimes completion percentage isn't necessarily a true test of accuracy. You know, there's a lot of times I try and explain on the broadcast, like Josh doesn't miss throws by three yards. That's a miscommunication on the outside. Josh thought the guy was going to, you know, sit inside and he broke out. And there is some flexibility in the route tree to do that. And so there could be miscommunications at times. And, you know, Josh is going to miss a throw by that wide of a margin. But when you have such a high percentage, the one player in particular that's a great sign for Shakir, and he throw he showed off some great run after catch ability. He had, uh, I think he's got the second fastest forty of anyone on this Bills offense. But at times, it, it seems like maybe he's so smooth he seems slower than he actually is until you see him start breaking away from guys. You're like, okay, he does have that 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 forty time that we saw at the combine, which I believe was in the four threes, and so he's been an asset to this team. Um, it's funny because you you sort of mentioned Gabe Davis without mentioning Gabe Davis. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it's, it's kind of odd coming out of the Steeler game, going into the Kansas City game, knowing Gabe Davis's history with the Chiefs rivalry and just those games in particular, and knowing that at this point, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but he almost seems like, sadly, he's an afterthought. At times you can you can – say that in in look there's times uh, i'll be honest i've thought it as well but gabe's an asset uh, you know I keep using the word asset he's an asset to this offense as well and he does all the little things out there and even in the games he hasn't had that production when you have a guy that can take the top off the defense like he can and has proven to do in the past then teams have to respect that element which can often open up things he's great blocking um in in look You know, I don't think Joe uh, Joe Brady is using hyperbole when he says that, you know, there's times where Gabe will go without a catch and they're sitting in the meeting rooms talking about how Gabe might have been the MVP of the game offensively because of all the little things that he does. And so, you know, some of those that doesn't go on the stat sheet. And as your number two receiver, you sure likely you would like it to. And, And I also think it's a little bit unfair to Gabe Davis that. You know, he explodes against Kansas City a couple of years ago in 2000, uh, 2021 in in the game that came down to the 13 seconds. He explodes for four touchdowns. 
And so we thought, okay, we're going to get this week in and week out from him. And he, you know, kind of has regressed to probably what he's going to be throughout his career, which is an NFL receiver, you know, probably a number two for a lot of teams. Would we like to see higher production at times? Yes, but he's shown up in big games. And so if we get him back this week, I, I think that helps this offense. I was going to say, he really is a bonus. And now, I mean, their weaponry in terms of the receiving core, I mean, Hardy started to make some plays. Sherfield, obviously, against Miami, made a, a huge play, a couple plays in that game. And then you got the tight ends. And then you got Cook out of the backfield when he catches the ball. Um, but they have, in terms of the pass game for Josh, lots of weaponry. Last thing um, on this game, the Steeler game, you know, talk about the depth and just, again, guys being coached up on the defensive side of the ball. Talk a little bit about guys like Klein and, and Elam and guys that you just did not, and Dorian Williams, that you did not expect to come into the game, have ridiculous rep numbers, and perform the way they did. I mean, give those guys credit for their constant preparation because that's not always easy to do as a backup. Most of the time as a backup throughout the week, you're running the show team. So it's likely that guys like Dorian Williams and Elam, they were running Pittsburgh defense against this Bills offense during the week, but then they are prepared on the Bills game plan to be able to step in and make plays. I mean, A.J. Klon was going on family vacation with his family at a Key West, had the RV packed up, and then comes in and has 11 tackles. Dorian Williams, to me, is a guy with tremendous upside. I don't know that his play recognition is quite there yet like some of the other guys, but his athleticism and hustle out there, it's fun to watch. And, you know, there's times he misses a tackle because he's flying around. But give me a guy that's flying around and makes a mistake over a guy that's hesitating and never makes a play or never makes an impact play and kind of makes a bunch of plays that – six yards down the field in the run game. Like I, I want the linebackers that are aggressive. And so, you know, credit those guys for being ready to go credit Sean McDermott and this defensive staff for enduring all of the injuries they have this season. And look, everyone knows I'm a Sean McDermott fan. I, I mean, I got my book behind me. He, he, he wrote the forward for my book. Everyone knows I'm a Sean McDermott fan, but the job he's done defensively this year in breaking all of his norms as far as getting ultra creative at times, playing to different uh, uh, schemes, different skill sets of guys, putting Jordan Poyer at dime linebacker, uh, different rush packages to help out this defensive line. I mean, it's been a miraculous coaching job, and I mentioned it early in the broadcast last week that a year ago in the Bills Stadium when they were playing against the Bengals, Everyone was so mad about the off coverage. Well, you know what? They started that game with a tremendous amount of press man on the outside, and they weren't giving them any of those freebies on the outside. So good on Sean for adjusting. And I'm not saying that's from fan opinion or media criticism, but understanding that last year in the playoffs, they gave up too many easy yards on the outside, so you adjust. I would say, too, you know, on both sides of the football, and I think we talked about this a lot at the end of last year, what was happening to the Bills? And again, the end of last year was definitely an asterisk, I think is fair for that team, right? They were they were worn out. They were beat up. The, the Hamlin thing obviously had so much to do with just their mental health going through that, that last three or four weeks of the season, that whatever it was. Um, so it was a little bit different, but we did talk about the fact that we felt like the lines of scrimmage were getting dominated on both sides. And you just have not seen that at all, really, this year. I mean, I, you can't point to it that they got beat up physically on the, uh, on the line of scrimmage on either side of the ball. I don't think at all this year. No, and definitely not on a consistent enough basis to make it uh, – you think it's an issue. So they bring in Connor McGovern – and they bring in Osiris Torrance in the draft, and those guys have shirt up the middle of that offensive line, and then Spencer Brown has taken his game to the next level this year, and you know he gets a full off season where he's not rehabbing. He's another year removed from that COVID year of college where he gets no playing time, you know, out on the field that year before he even comes to the Bills. So he's getting experience, and he's played well this year. And then defensively. I mean, Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver, that's as good of a one-two punch at the D-tackle position as you got in this league. Leonard Floyd has been a massive addition over the summer by Brandon Bean. And then, you know, these defensive ends, Greg Rousseau, A.J. Panessa. I mean, we've seen splash plays all across that defensive line. And I'll tell you what, and I've been critical of Von Miller like many have this year. That last game, he showed about as much promise as we've seen. And so... 
You know, you go into this Kansas City game this week understanding that you're not going to be able to just consistently blitz Patrick Mahomes. You got to bring pressure with a four-man rush. And, you know, I, I'm I'm optimistic about this defensive line being able to get it done. And certainly Vaughn has some history with Kansas City based on his time in Denver for years and years and years and years. So uh, that helps for sure. Um, let's fast forward now and get into the Kansas City game. Do you ever break a helmet? I never broke a helmet. I have some helmets behind me right now, one of which is game worn. And so there's some nicks on it. But no, I've never seen that in uh, I, I've never worn a helmet that looked like his. So I don't know, even know what brand it was that Mahomes cracked, but that was pretty wild. I'm, I'm, I assume it has something to do with the with the sub zero wind chill and all that. But yeah, that that wasn't a good look for the league when the helmet breaks out there. Yeah, not not at all. Um, so let's talk about Kansas City. Why are they not a, as dominant on the offensive side of the football as they have been? I mean, Mahomes pretty much he'll whoever he plays with is is always a threat right but just because of his abilities but is it is it is it weapons i mean we've all talked about since they lost tyreek they weren't going to be the same well they didn't have tyreek a year ago and they were pretty good uh but this year it seems way down kelsey is not the same guy where she rice has picked it up but is it all of that is is it weaponry lack thereof is it play calling obviously the enemy goes to washington here comes Matt Nagy and maybe Andy Reid in a combination of the two. What what do you think has kind of held them back this year? Yeah, I think a lot of it's the playmakers on the outside. And, you know, they lose Hill and they still piece it together last year, but I, they just don't have quite the downfield threat presence. Now, Rasheed Rice, they drafted him in the second round this year in the draft. He's coming into form. He's kind of played better and better as this year goes on. And then he goes for over 150 last week against the Dolphins and you know, to me, when you look at Travis Kelsey, I mean, and this is pure speculation, but he hurt his knee in the preseason and, you know, he, he missed some time. And you know what, especially when you're in your thirties, you're, you're managing that throughout the year. And as the season went on, his production went down. I, I don't, um, I don't discount that he potentially was slowed down by that knee that got him in the preseason and it affected him throughout this year. And I also say this. He, he lit the world on fire, you know, the first, you know, maybe six or so games of the season. Well, then everyone's putting all their attention on him, which should open it up for other guys. And then you have Kadarius Tony dropping balls and you have other guys just not making plays. Well, then you take away Kelsey and they just don't have a whole lot left. And so this is a Chiefs organization, which I give them some credit because they're defense is excellent right now one of the tops in the league well they've invested a ton of draft capital thinking okay we have Mahomes on the offense side of the ball he'll just make it right he'll be the Tom Brady that you could put anybody out there with him and he'll make it right and then we'll just invest a ton in the defense so their defense is playing really well well a lot of those guys that they put on the offensive side of the ball with Mahomes haven't made those plays yeah for sure and and I would think you know if Tony can't play this week um, and I don't expect him to, but he's, you know, who knows? We'll see. And then Sky Moore is out. I mean, all, those are arguably their two fastest guys. You take that out of the mix. Now they're even less explosive um, with the receiving core. You mentioned the defense. They've been absolutely terrific. I mean, second in the league, uh, yards against, second in the league, points against. Um, like the Bills' depth, they have their depth been very tested. They've had some significant guys out for significant times during the season. Have somehow gotten through that, and now they are healthier. So, so what do you make uh, uh, of this game in general now? What what concerns you the most about the Chiefs coming into this game on both sides of the ball? And then, additionally, obviously injuries for the Bills are, are really difficult. I mean, Wednesday's injury report for me was very promising. We see Douglas, Teron Johnson, and Dotson all limited, which is better than a DNP. So, man, if we were to get at least those three guys back, how significant would that be in this game, too? It would be huge. I mean, the thing, when I look at this game, my biggest concern is the injuries on defense. I mean, last week, when you're looking at the linebackers that finished the game, it's your fourth and fifth linebacker on the depth chart, your fifth and sixth corners, I believe, out there. And so – you know, that's 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 tough to overcome. And so for me, you know, the Bills defensive injuries, that's the scariest thing to me. Taron Johnson, I, Cam Lewis, he does a great job when he comes in, whether it's safety, nickel, corner. You know, he is uh, he's a valuable piece to that secondary being able to kind of do everything back there. But Taron Johnson's the only all pro player this year on the Bills voted in uh, all pro player. They've 
they had other guys that could have had considerations. That's another full uh, other podcast we could do. But the Bills' defensive injuries is probably the thing that worries me the most. Um, you know, when you look at the game this week, you know, Kansas City's defense is excellent. They are very, very tough at Arrowhead because Steve Spagnola, the defensive coordinator, he's so diverse. Well, it's hard to communicate there. You know, their crowd is as loud as Highmark Stadium. You know, they they affect the football game. And so it becomes difficult to communicate the fact that the Bills will be at home and they'll be able to audibly be able to check protections and check plays. That helps. And so to me, my biggest thing coming into this game is can this defense hold up and and keep shutting teams down? I mean, in this six-game win streak, I believe the Bills are averaging giving up 16.5 points per game. I mean, you hold this Kansas City team to 20 points or less, I have full confidence. I'll lock that in right now and, and say this offense, with playing at home against their defense, will be able to put up enough to get the win. All right, finally, um, I know you're a country music guy. I've actually seen you sing some country music, and you're better than people might think. Um are you a Swifty? Mm, I, no, I wouldn't say I'm a Swifty, but if you looked at my Spotify for the last year, uh, it's probably my top five based upon my daughter loving her music. <laughs> so, uh, no, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a Swifty. And I almost wish the Bills like would bring like Luke Combs or somebody in for this one and someone adopt the Bills Mafia. We do have Benny the Butcher, though. We got That's Benny. True. And so we, we, we have our hip-hop artists there, but... You know, I'll say this, the, the Swifty effect is real. I mean, I came home from, I guess, the Kansas City Bills game. And the next morning, the first thing my kids asked me was, did you see Taylor Swift at the game? And I'm like, well, I saw her. I did not speak to her. There was tremendous security around her. But, man, that that Taylor Swift effect is real. I assume she's got to be in attendance this week. I mean, you got a playoff game. She'll probably be there. So uh, we'll see if Bills Mafia gives her a warm welcome uh absolutely okay so please before you go uh plug everything you need to plug you got plenty of time go right ahead i know there's a laundry list yeah so we'll just plug one thing the center on buffalo podcast that's been really fun for me to work on we're actually going to post the audio back on this on the center on buffalo podcast so uh for those listening on that platform thank you for tuning in and if uh, you're tuning in to Bull in the Basement, then, you know, check out maybe some of the episodes or re-listen to this one if you want to. But, you know, it's it's been fun for me um, to, through my prep throughout the week, to be able to just add some content out there and then, you know, dig in uh, on some conversations with either some old teammates or guys around the league. I had Kyle Williams on last week. I mean, I don't think he's done media in three years. And so fun catching up with him. Some, you know, it it, it went from, you know, a conversation similar to this to just us bantering back and forth and making fun of each other. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, but that one got the best ratings and reviews. So uh, I guess that's what the people want to hear. I'll tell you what we had, uh, we had uh, Arthur Motes on, on last week. And uh, if you haven't had him on, you know him well, you played with him and you know, his personality um, definitely get, uh, don't cross the moats on your, your podcast. Cause he's fantastic. As, yeah. As I actually were. had him on prior to the uh, preseason game against the Steelers. So perfect. I mean, that is uh that's a dude full of energy, full of positive energy at that great dude. Well, I mean, look, read your book. That's another thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's that speaks to positive energy. I mean, you're, you're a spokesperson for positive energy like he is. So I appreciate that. All right, man. Well, thank you again, and uh, safe travel back up to Buffalo. Uh, we're getting a lot of winter again midweek here, and, uh, you know, by game time, it should settle down, and both teams obviously are used to this kind of weather this time of year. So I, I can't say anyone's got necessarily a weather uh, advantage, but it should be a great game. Thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Anytime, brother.